morning, this is the feast of the Nativity of our Lord, Christmas Day, the first Mass. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 2. <clears throat> Dearly beloved, the grace of God our Savior hath appeared to all men, instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly <coughs> desires, we should live soberly and justly and godly in this world looking for the blessed hope and coming of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and might cleanse to himself a people acceptable, a pursuer of good works. These things speak and exhort in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the Holy Gospel, taken from that according to St. Luke, chapter 2. At that time there went forth a decree from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be enrolled. This first enrollment was made by Tyrrhenus, the governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went out from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into the, in Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and of the family of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his espoused wife, who was with child. And it came to pass that when they were there, her days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds watching and keeping the night watches over their flock. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the brightness of God shone round them, and they feared with a great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you tidings of great joy. That shall be to all the people, for this day is born to you in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall, shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And suddenly there with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of good will. That's by the words of the Holy Gospel. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of goodwill. <coughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, dear friends, dear guests, the chapel is pretty packed tonight. I was not expecting this many people. Welcome. It's a great joy to celebrate Christmas with so many in this small chapel in the middle of nowhere in Boston, Kentucky. I tried so hard to prepare for this sermon, and seeing all the people here moves me first with emotion. I wish to wish you all a very merry Christmas. Finally, Advent is over, and we expect the Savior in the manger. With great joy, we come and we worship God made man. As I mentioned earlier in the sermon this morning, St. Bernard tells us that that phrase alone is enough. To strike any heart, any cold heart, to warmth and love, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became man. There's two great mysteries we celebrate on Christmas. God wrapped in flesh and a virgin mother. Everywhere the church throughout the entire liturgy speaks of these two mysteries. 
And you cannot find anywhere in the liturgy, in the matins, in the psalms, in the lauds, in the office, in the mass, where these two both aren't mentioned. They're always together. God wrapped in flesh and a virgin mother. St. Augustine says, the nature and the laws of nature withheld, they stopped for such a mystery. The invisible was seen. The uncontainable contained in flesh. The all-powerful made humble. A virgin, a mother. <coughs> None of it made sense. Because Adam and Eve decided to commit sin, and sin doesn't make sense. St. Bernard says when we commit sin, we're not being human. We're not being ourselves. We're acting against nature. And nature was turned upside down. And the world was condemned, but God made a promise that he would restore all things and turn it back upside down, and he did in a most marvelous way. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was made man, wrapped in flesh. Go, Karen Jay says, <coughs> in your mind, to the physical place. Go to the manger, and what do you see? Infinite God, infinite majesty, wrapped in human flesh. One of the saints asked, I wonder, he said, is it more amazing for the angels to look at God in heaven in all his glory, or to see that same God wrapped in human flesh? I've mentioned this before. To those who know, but to those who are new, might as well mention it again. And for those who forgot. St. Gregory says that the angels did not like men particularly. The angels looked down upon man as a cursed species and race. They had a disdain for mankind because of the fall. And he says, look at the Old Testament. <coughs> As you go along the Old Testament, you see that every time an angel comes, men fall on their face and they worship them and they fear. And the angel doesn't bother saying, don't fall down and get dirty. He doesn't bother saying, get back up. I'm just a nice angel. He gives them a message and he moves along. St. Gregory said angels didn't particularly like man. But he said on this night, the first time in scripture, we see an angel come and appear before man, the shepherds. And the shepherds fall down in, in fear. And the angel for the first time says to man, besides our lady, angel Gabriel, but says to mankind in general, do not fear. I bring to you tidings of great joy. And Gregory says the angels could no longer have a disdain and a dislike toward the human race because they saw their infinite God as one of them. We sing in the Matins, in one of the responsories, that he who is uncontainable was contained in flesh and sat on the lap of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is the greatest mystery. On this Feast of Christmas, every priest is privileged to say three Masses. We say three Masses all the time because we travel. But this day, whether you travel or not, you say three Masses. The Church wants to show to her people how to celebrate Christmas. We celebrate with three Masses. So Gary tells us, with all of these mysteries... That St. Augustine says, don't make sense, first looking at them. When the God-man turned everything back right, when we look at all these mysteries, how do we put into practice to appreciate the Christmas mystery? Well, he says three things. First, let's look at our church, the Bride of Christ who does it perfectly. 
what does the church do? Well, first of all, we had the vigil this morning. And we started to celebrate already in anticipation. <coughs> and immediately at midnight, we celebrate Mass. And we worship the baby Jesus, born. We waited so long. A couple years ago, it was forbidden to celebrate Mass after noon. You only could do morning Masses except Christmas. Because the church wanted to immediately, at the hour when Our Lady was accomplished, her time was accomplished, that hour at midnight, in a manger, she gave birth. And immediately we celebrate our redemption. The angels no longer look at us with scorn. They bring good news. And we celebrate. They can no longer disdain us when they see their God is one of us. So immediately the first thing we do is celebrate Mass. And then what else does the church do? For 40 days. And I can go all into the different times and seasons, and Septuagesima comes early sometimes, and Easter is later sometimes, but the basic point is, for 40 days, we celebrate Christmas. And Garagier also says, with this star, this sun, the sun, S-U-N, of justice, God made man, around this sun is a constellation of beautiful stars, more beautiful than any other time of the year. He says, look at the feasts that come after Christmas. St. Stephen, the first martyr, the holy innocents. St. John, the evangelist. We celebrate for 40 days in white, in joy, all the way into the purification of Our Lady, which is one of the most ancient feasts of Our Lady. Liturgists don't even know when it started, it's so old. It comes straight from Scripture. So for 40 days, besides a couple martyrs here and there, especially the first 20, besides a couple martyrs, the priest is vested in white every day. The Christmas trees are lit. Ornaments are there. It took the seminarians all week to set all this up. I believe there were, I said there were 80 trees this morning. Somebody doubted me. So I want to go count again. We can count after Mass. I think there's about 80 trees. If there's 75 or so, I'm, that's rounded up. 80 trees. All light lit. Manger lit. White, gold, in this case, vestments. White the entire season. For 20 days straight. And then the rest of the 20 days, intermingled with the white of virgins and confessors and a couple martyrs, representing the shedding of blood, red vestments. And then after which, green. Which Garanger says, because when the springtime came... And then we go into the fruit of the spring, of the greenery, of the growing, because the darkness in the winter is over. <coughs> St. Augustine and St. Gregory talk about it, and they both say the world makes fun of us. They mock us, and they mock the Catholics, and they mock us. They say that the Catholics stole Christmas, because the pagans used to celebrate the winter solstice. Because on this day, this 25th of December, the sun's light starts to increase. So they say Catholics stole Christmas. They stole the feast and put Christmas there. And they're superstitious. Both St. Augustine and St. Chrys John Chrysostom, or Saint, I think it was St. John Chrysostom, say no, that's not the case. And especially St. Augustine. He says pretty simply, do they not realize that God made the Son? St. Augustine says, God chose on which day to be born. He also chose who, which woman to be born of. And guess what? God also made that son, and he also made that woman. It wasn't by accident, St. Augustine says, that our Lord was born on the 25th of December, which historically he was, according to the, cens the census that was taken. St. John Chrysostom proves that. St. Augustine says it was no mistake, and Garon Chase says, it's not for us to be confused, but to believe even more. For us who believe, believe even more that God did that for a reason. He chose to be born on the 25th of December of a virgin mother. Because nature points towards God. 
St. Paul says in the, in the letter to the Romans, we can see, we know the things unseen from the things we can see. Nature points towards God. On this day, the light begins to increase. And on the 24th of June, the Feast of St. John the Baptist, the sun begins to decrease the light. That's not by accident. Many of the fathers talk about this great mystery. And St. Augustine says, we celebrate today. He says, not because the sunlight grows, which is a good thing. Because here, all of a sudden, it's 4 or 5 p.m. and it's dark already. You just woke up from your afternoon nap and you feel like you got to go back to bed. I mean, it's not always a bad thing, but when you're trying to wake up for dinner and it's dark outside, it's kind of hard. And then you're even in a worse mood than before you took a nap. Not that I've done it from experience, but in seminary. It's dark at like 4 p.m. So yeah, it's nice that the sun begins to grow again, the light. But St. Augustine even says, that's not why we celebrate. We recognize that God did that because for a reason. He did it on purpose. He's God. He created the Son. He created Our Lady. He chose to be born on the 25th of December because St. John the Baptist said, He must increase and I must decrease. And so on His birth, our Lord's birth, light increases. And it does so until John the Baptist's birth, the 24th of June, in which the sunlight starts to decrease. Because the God made the laws of nature. God can suspend the laws of nature. One of the things I think the Spanish and the Mexicans like to look at a lot, a very beautiful thing, is they look, at least from some of the Christmas songs I listen to, I mean, ask Chewy, the seminary, and he would know, but I listen to the Christmas music sometimes from, from the Spanish songs and so on, they focus a lot on the beauty of the animals seeing God be born. The animals saw God be born. In one of the responsories of Matins, we sing the same thing. O magnum mysterium, O great mystery, that the animals saw God born and laid in a manger. Traditionally, they would say he was born between an ox and a donkey, representing the Jews and the Gentiles. Representing us. And laid in a manger. God is in control of the laws of nature. God chose to be born of a virgin. The infinite chose to be wrapped in finite flesh. To take on the form of a servant and a slave, as St. Paul says. To die. God's in control of the laws of nature. And so they take notice of that. Uh, the animals can see God be born. God created them. God can sit on the lap of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The animals watched in astonishment. On this night as well, one of the fathers, I forget which, mentions pretty bluntly. He says, let us rejoice. Christmas especially recently, and he's not even talking about our times, so let's reiterate this for our times. 2023. <coughs> Christmas is being less and less celebrated. You see less lights. The reason for Christmas is being less celebrated. A couple, a couple days ago, the seminarians went on a little trip to light, uh, the lights under Louisville. It's pretty neat. You can feel the Christmas spirit under there. And there's very many beautiful lights and so on. They did have a nativity scene, which was good. But it was very much focused on Santa Claus and Olaf and Barbie. Yeah, that wasn't fun. You close your eyes to that part. Some of don't love close your eyes. Pink lights and all that. But at least at the end, they did have one saying. Just one. But brought a little bit of hope. They said, keep Christ in Christmas. But that's because we're in Kentucky. Everywhere in the world, Christ is being pushed out of Christmas. Happy holidays, Santa Claus, ho, ho, ho. We see less and less, and less people celebrate Christmas. And this father didn't even know about our times. He was speaking back then. But he says very bluntly, let the Jew be scandalized. Let the Greek doubt let the pagan mock the birth of the God-man in a manger, not in a palace, in the cold, 
not with a grand entry of all the human race accepting him, with a couple shepherds, Our Lady and St. Joseph, and just the angels, and the animals. I say this, I think, every year, but when I was a young boy serving at Midnight Mass one year, the priest said, there's a reason why they don't make scratch and sniff nativity scenes. He was born in the manger. Let him doubt. Let him mock. We have the reason to celebrate. So there's three things I wish you all to do. Coming from Garage Three things. What emotions do we take this Christmas season with? Firstly is adoration. Adoration. Return to God the humility that he has shown to us. St. Augustine says that man should be ashamed to be proud. He says man is such a bold creature. How can man, how can we, man, mankind, be proud for whose sake of God became humble? We can never compare to the humility of God. But let us at least try to return the favor. He put off the grandeur of his divinity. He was a baby, an infant, who wept and cried and fed at his mother's breast. He allowed himself to be completely taken care of by his parents, to be brought home with them when he was 12 years old, and was obedient to them, which we'll celebrate later on, the Feast of the Holy Family, that Christ was obedient to Our Lady and St. Joseph, not just St. Joseph the Father, a man, to a girl, she was 16, 17, a virgin maiden. God was be humbled and obedient to them. He didn't just come to redeem us, He came in the most humble way. Let us return the favor, go to the crib, and after Mass we'll adore the infant Jesus at the communion rail. And Garanche says, you better come with humility. And you better come with a gift. Don't show up to a birthday party without a gift. Usually awkward. But this time it's just insulting. Everybody that shows up to the manger better have a gift. And they better come with most humility in their hearts as they can. No, you cannot have the humility of the God-man. But at least you can try to return the favor and to come to the crib and adore God made man. That's why St. Bernard says, don't say any more. Our lips are honeyed enough with the beautiful saying that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was made man. Don't say any more. That's enough. Just adore in profound humility. Adoration, the first thing, adoration. And we have to be humble. Crush pride. Put it out this Christmas season. How can we? We do all the time. I don't know how it happens, but we all do. We end up being proud. How can we walk around? Those of us who know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, really, physically, actually, 2,023 years ago on this day, lied in a cold manger as a baby, humbled before the entire human race. They didn't even know he came. How can we dare to be proud? Love. Return with love. Why did Christ come? Why did he do all this? What is he looking for? And that's what our <coughs> gifts have to be. You don't come to the manger without a gift. You don't come to the door of the Christ child without a gift. What are our gifts? Well, what does the birthday boy want? My fathers say that our Lord came, became man for one reason only. He wanted our love. He wanted our love. All the fathers say he didn't have to shed every drop of his blood. He didn't have to be crowned with thorns. He didn't have to be scourged. He didn't have to be mocked. 
He didn't have to be cold. He didn't have to weep. He didn't have to be heartbroken. He didn't have to be abandoned by his friends. He didn't have to watch his father die. He didn't have to be betrayed, spat upon, mocked, and blasphemed. He didn't have to be. As a famous story of St. Matilda, Lord, why did you go to the cross and fall so many times? It was my wedding dance for you, he said. I wanted to attract the love. I want you to love me. That's all he wants. So no matter how poor, how rich you are, every single one of us can approach the communion rail for Holy Communion and afterwards to adore the baby Jesus with love in our heart as a gift. Love and humility. That's all he wants. Next is joy. I've already spoken about that a little bit. There's so much emotion going on and mixing up my sermon in which order to go in, but you get the point. We were like, joy. And lastly, gratitude. And Grand J says the same thing. No. We're not capable of returning thanks for what God has done for us. But the good part is he doesn't want a just return. We can't pay back what he's given us. He doesn't expect us to. He just wants our participation in his love. He just wants us to love him. That's it. That's it. Love him. Above all things. <coughs> The first commandment, we hear it all the time, but do you love God? What do you do when you love someone? You think about them, you talk to them as much as you can. It's really annoying. Teenagers fall in love, talk on the phone for hours, and that was I'm glad I became a priest. <laughs> That's a real sign of a vocation. There was a priest in uh, Africa. One of our priests in the seminary told me when they got back, there was a marriage case they were dealing with, and there was serious problems and so on. And the seminarians were sitting watching him do marriage advice and marriage counseling. And he said to his seminarians, Look, boys, this is why you become a priest. <laughs> marriage advice and counseling is the surest way to form priests. It's funny, a lot of the seminarians we have come from the young adult gathering. <laughs> what do you do when you're in love? You talk for hours. To the rest of the world, it seems crazy. And it is. You teenagers, quote unquote, are in love. But you talk and you spend time and you think about and you plan. And you defend. And you gift. That's what you do when you love. Do you do that with God? Do you think about him on purpose because you want to? Or do you say your prayers because you have to? Do you tell God you love him? Want to bring him gifts? Adore him in the manger? Think about him? It's a choice. Love God. That's all he wants. That's what our Christmas gift, that's what I ask of you this year. Adoration, joy, gratitude. And that comes with love of God. I have so many more things to say. I read and read and read and read and read and read. But I'm going to just jumble it up more. <coughs> and, because as we were processing out the seminary and said, Father, keep it short. <laughs> That's the main reason. But I think St. Bernard is right in this case. Even though there's so many more mysteries to talk about, Christmas is, as one seminarian called me earlier, Father Christmas. It's my favorite time. There's so much more to say. I have so many emotions. So much joy. As I'm sure all of you do too. But St. Bernard says the more you talk about it, you just spoil it. Everyone's like, yeah, Father, please, he's right. It's midnight. Wrap it up. So I'll finish with one more mystery. 
We talk about the Christ child wrapped in flesh, and the second mystery is the Virgin Mother. The Virgin Mother. Our Lady was praised by the woman in the crowd. She said, Blessed is the womb that bore thee in the paps that gave thee suck. And our Lord says, Yea, rather, blessed is he who hears the word of God and keeps it. St. Bonaventure, commenting on this, says, Our Lady was blessed because she bore the Christ child. But she was more blessed because she heard the word of God and kept it. We imitate the church. We imitate Our Lady. Hear the word of God and keep it in your soul. Put it into action and you will be blessed. What did she do? She clothed him in swaddling clothes. She fed him. She nourished him. The Father say, do the same thing spiritually because that's even greater. That's why Our Lady was great. Because she didn't just do the physical bearing of our Lord. She also spiritually bore him in her heart. And we can all do the same thing, following her example. So clothe him with love, the fathers say. Feed him in your soul with meditation. Keep him company. One, forgive me for not remembering who, father says, yeah, our lady bore him physically. That mystery in itself, we can't even comprehend, but do you not realize that you hold him in your heart, if you're in the state of grace, that same God, and you receive him actually in Holy Communion? You spiritually are connected with him? Did you realize that? Do we pay attention enough to that? Dear brother, blessed is he who hears the word of God and keeps it. That means practices it. That means love him in return. Keep his commandments. How do we know we love God? Keep his commandments. Keep the faith. Love the faith. Love God. Imitate Our Lady. She's our example. Feed him with meditation in your soul. Receive him with great love and joy. How did Our Lady physically receive him? Now conclude with this, with a meditation on Our Lady. <coughs> our Lord chose to be born of a virgin. As again, St. Augustine said, he's God. He chose what he wanted. He could have come man, become a man at 33 years old and went straight to the cross, but he didn't. He chose to be nine months in the womb of the Virgin Mary and spend his whole childhood and early adult life with her up into his 30s. He had a landing ground to go to. She was full of grace, Angel Gabriel said. And so he came to her because she was full of grace. Why, Garanger says then, did he go to the Blessed Virgin Mary? Why did he choose her among all other women? Why is she blessed among all other women? Why is she full of grace? Why did she get the privilege of bearing the Christ child physically? Because she bore him first spiritually. She was full of grace. When he was born at midnight on December 25th, Our Lady went into ecstasy. As well as St. Joseph, some say. And our Lord passed through the womb of the Virgin Mary, St. Gregory says, like light passes through a window. And remained, she remained intact a virgin. Somebody made fun of me because I mentioned it every year, but I'm doing it again. There's a debate about how our Lord was first handled. Some say he, was, he first immediately went onto the floor out of humility. It's probably the Jesuits who say that. It's my least favorite opinion. Then the others say that he was actually taken up by St. Michael, his guardian angel. Some say St. Michael was his guardian angel on earth. And then handed to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Sounds like a Franciscan opinion. But the true opinion is that when he was born, he was immediately grabbed and placed in the arms of the Blessed Virgin Mary, because that's where he wanted to be anyway. 
There he laid in her arms, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and she adored her God and her child. Imitate her in this adoration. As the saying goes, she first held him, and she kissed his feet, because he was her God. And then she kissed his tiny little hands, because he was her Lord. And then finally she kissed his sweet face, because he was her son. All of these examples. Merry Christmas, dear faithful friends and those visiting. Afterwards, please, you're welcome to come down and celebrate with cookies and hot chocolate and eggnog and so on. After Mass, we'll have the adoration of the Bambino. Come with your gift of love, clean heart, no pride, humility, love, adoration, and celebrate. <laughs> Your Aunt Jay's right. Forty days. Not too much. When we really take our faith seriously and we know what God did for us, we celebrate for forty days because He came to save us from our sins. He came that there may be grace more abundantly and love more abundantly. So we celebrate. Now let us continue on to the Mass and with these same sentiments receive Holy Communion on this feast. And again... Merry Christmas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.